Now, people ask me a lot of time about worship, so I want to take a minute out to explain to you this simple illustration. Now, through life, we've talked about a little earlier, through life, situations through the day can come at us. Some good, say amen, we love the good stuff, but also challenges. And if we don't handle them right, which often is the case in my case, I need to handle them in Jesus. They're designed to make us hard like this sponge. This is a pretty hard sponge, even though it's a little one. Worship is designed to cause us to be able to receive the word. It's a preparation, giving glorification, giving honor and praise. We worship him because we adore and we love him. We praise him because we want everyone to know about his mighty works and mighty acts. But that involvement gets us ready in our heart to be soaked with the anointing so that we might receive the word. So here is you and I. We've been through a rough week. Oh, God forbid. You know, and, and Lord, we come into your presence. I just come to worship you. And Lord, I can't sing very well, but I bring a joyful noise. I bring my heart and enthusiasm and excitement because I read the end of the book and we won. Amen. So what we're journeying through is we know Christ has won. He's already finished the work. But now he's guarding us and protecting us. We'll get to that in the word. So here we are. We're worshiping. Boo! We're dropped into the presence of God. Now, what do you think is going to happen to that sponge? It's going to soak up the water. Now, depending on how hard the sponge is, is how fast it soaks the water up. If it's real hard, it takes a while to break through. But if it's hard, but not that hard because it's been exercised and meeting with God daily and, and being with God, then it gets pretty soaky when we get in the presence of God. Are you like me? When I say, Father, I love you, I begin to weep. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that, but my heart just is so overwhelmed with his, his wonderfulness, how he takes care of all of us, that it just makes me squishy. <laughs> You know what's just neat about this, Joanna? If you come over and I'm all squishy like that and you give me a big hug, it's going to get on you. <laughs> Amen. So we're going to call this, we've been doing a series called Reigning in Life in Christ. But we're going to call this the Everlasting Covenant. Now I'm going to come at it at a different way than I have before. And what I mean by that is, we're going to show you that the word is forever settled in heaven. In other words, when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. He meant it. Everything that's required for you and I to be saved, everything that's required for us to take back the earth and to put it back into God's hands and to arrest the devil and strip the enemy has been finished when Jesus was on the cross. Now, why did he go to hell? He just brought the news. And so I always like to do this. I love Carmen. Carmen's on our brothers dancing with streets of gold up there in heaven. But Carmen came out with a song. Do you remember? It, it was about uh, knocking the devil out at his resurrection, you know. And it's a countdown. Ten. Like a launch. And then Jesus gets up and then he polarizes the enemy. And yay, the champion, right? And so, but I want to let you know that when Jesus said it was finished on the cross, this is nice to know, it was finished. All that was left is cleanup. Do you remember that earthquake? Remember, it went so dark. Hello? And the whole earth shook. It shook all around the world. Why? Because the Son of God gave up his life for you and I. Woo! And, you know, when he did that, it says the separation in the temple of the curtain rent from top to bottom. In other words, God is no longer hindered. He is free in the earth because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, isn't it funny that Jesus said it is finished before he actually died? And then when he died, he only went down into hell to deliver the message. The message was, 
to those in the bottom of the earth that were good in Abraham's bosom paradise. He says, look, we're leaving here in a couple of moments. I'm going over to the devil and I'm taking his control back. So he just walked over to the enemy. He didn't punch him. He already stripped him. Satan was just kind of holding the keys out, really trembling because Jesus, now you need to know this, stripped him of every supernatural power that he originally gave him. And what he stole from Adam, stripped him. So all Satan has, now listen to me very careful. Hope it inspires questions. What does he have? He has an ability to deceive. To deceive human beings who don't know God, especially because there's nothing for them to reference. God, we must reference God's standard to know what is right and wrong. Aren't we exposed to good and evil every day? Sure we are. And we need that extra help to discern if there's a trickster out there. Now, sad to say, because of Adam's sin, we were thrown into a world where we actually, are you ready for this? living and breathing amongst beings we can't see. Everyone take a pause. We know them as angels and demons. They're all around, but you can't see them. Thank God. They're behind most of the evil or behind a curtain. And that curtain shields us from seeing them because... Now, there's more to talk. If you want to talk more on that area, we're having lunch. But so I love those times. Hey, Pastor, can you explain that a little more? But anyway, so he, they're behind a shield. The only ones that you and I deal with are the ones that we let in when we were young. Everyone say, God forbid. Now, just momentarily, do you remember when you were young? Do you remember the hard times? How about when you were a teenager? What happened to you? What didn't? Some good, some bad, you know. All of that was geared. God was trying to get our attention. And the enemy was trying to defile us. We were exposed to that. We couldn't help it. We were thrown into that. Not our own fault. But we still have to deal with it so we don't let it overcome us. Say amen. Jesus says, don't be overcome, but overcome evil with good. All right. Now, why did you explain that? I want to tell you, two kingdoms only operating in the world. We're in the middle. Kingdom of darkness to cover things up. The kingdom of light to reveal things to us. Told you last week that when Adam ate of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, that fruit, it had, it had some stuff in it. It dumbed us down. Hello? Made us stupid. Now, please don't get mad at me. It's the truth. Even science proves that we just don't want to talk about it. And we were not made that way. We weren't made this way. This is what Adam did. So this body that you have, the mind that you have, are very limited because of what's in our flesh. Everyone say, what's in our flesh? Sin, right? All right, tell me what sin is. Sin is your separation from God. What is sin? It's very good, by the way. The idea is you need to know that sin is the nature of Satan. What was in that fruit? Satan's nature. DNA. God was not saying, if you disobey me, I'm going to make you like this, this, this human you are. No, God has always been a father. Always sought a reason to restore us, hasn't he? except when we poison ourselves. Then he has to send his son and shred off our old cocoon and bring forth a newness of life. And at our resurrection, he changes our body, doesn't he? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, this corruption puts on incorruption. This mortal will be swallowed up into immortality and death. Oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? For a Christian, we don't have death. We just close our eyes. We might, some people will suffer. Some people will do that. But if they have Jesus in their heart, you close your eyes and take that last breath. 
and you're right there in the presence of God. There's no waiting. You're not sitting in the ground. There's one particular uh, group of Christians. They do love the Lord. Says that you're going to lay in the ground and your soul's going to sleep. And however long God takes, you'll never know it because you're asleep. <laughs> that is not. It says your body will lay in the ground like it's asleep, but God's going to raise your body up. Why? And strip Satan's nature out of us. Remember, sin is the nature of Satan that's in our blood and in our flesh. It causes us to age sick, causes us to get sick and disease. That's why when I pray for you and Linda prays for you, we pray that you be always stay disease-free and accident-free. Amen. Do that for me, please. All right. We do. All right, let's read our paragraph and let's get into this. I don't want to keep you all day. Sure I am. We're going to cook for you. This is, my wife wants me to call it a scripture. So this is our scripture up there. Got it? All right, Psalms 37, verse 3 through 7, just the first part of 7a. It says, trust in the Lord and do good. Wow. All God wants us to do is take his goodness in us and do good with it. Amen. Dwell in the land. Where has God put you? Where are you living? How is your place where you dwell with God? Dwell in the land. Feed on his faithfulness. Can anyone say God is very faithful? How about to us? He's never let us down. Can you ever point out a time that he's let you down? No. Amen. And he says, dwell in the land, feed on his faithfulness, delight yourself also in the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. And he shall give you the desires of your what? Now, we bring that to the New Testament. Who lives in our heart? So if we delight in God, God expands, he grows, he blesses. And guess what? What's in your heart is him and him in your heart. And he knows what's good and what's well. And your life takes on wholeness, completeness. He gives us the desires of our heart just to have life again, to experience and be with God again. Can you say amen? Then it says in five, this is what we need to do because oftentimes we take side trails of our own choosing. Commit your way to the Lord, verse five. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as a light and your justice as a noonday. I love 7 and 8. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now, that doesn't mean sit and sleep. The word wait there is the same word which means to wait on him, to serve because of him, to help like a waiter would wait or like a servant would wait on his master. Master, what is it you desire? Oh, poached eggs, you know, this kind of thing. And you can kind of get ideas through all the films and things you saw. How a good butler does that, maybe a good chauffeur, amen? People that have that servitude, very important. Because the body of Christ says, is supposed to be walking in the love of Christ. Can you say amen? We're supposed to be a good example, amen? And, and we are. All right, are you with me? So, the everlasting covenant, what it is, what it isn't. All right, so let's go ahead and get into this. Here it is, an amazing truth. All we need to get in on it is our faith. So an everlasting covenant is made between two parties usually, okay? So we know that there are two covenants or two testaments in the Bible. Say amen. Let me say this carefully but graciously. Both of those covenants are perfect from God's standpoint. Can you say amen? The covenant of the law and the Old Testament was accurate. It did its purpose and it fulfilled what God purposed for it to do. And for you to understand what the law and the covenant of the Old Testament was, was to bring man to an understanding that we can't wander off on our own. We need God to help us live our life and get off this planet. It's a simple message. You'll find that in the book of Galatians. 
All right, so I'm not putting down Judaism or any of that, but the old covenant's been fulfilled in Christ because the old covenant made us work for our salvation. Keep the Ten Commandments. Can't keep them, Lord. Do this. And then people added ordinances. Watch the food you eat. Make sure you don't hang around the unclean. And all these rules and regulations, what happens? Now, you guys are parents. What happens to your children when you give them a lot of rules and regulations? They rebel. Come on. That's because the law had one big flaw. And everyone say the old covenant was perfect, but had one flaw. Here, perfect, but had a flaw? Yeah, the flaw was you, us, mankind. We couldn't keep our promises. So God made a perfect covenant to give us one message. We can't keep our promises. We really need help because we have been duped. We have an infection, Sherry. The infection is sin that eats away at our life. And the only cure is walking with Jesus, having Jesus in our heart. Because daily, we put our body as a living sacrifice, and God reduces our aging and that curse in our body. Read about it. It's in Romans chapter 12. Are you with me? So, Let's look at the power of knowing your covenant in Jesus Christ. We're going to cover four things. Hopefully, I'll do well at presenting them to you. Number one, the word of the covenant. The word of his covenant. How powerful is it? Has God given his word? And if you know he's given his word, then will he keep it? Absolutely, but you've got to know he will. You've got to believe that you believe he will. So there you can have confidence and trust that if you pray and ask God according to his promises to us, you just lift them up to God and say, Lord, I believe I receive. Now, it might look impossible to you. I'm sure it looked impossible to the Israelites. But they believed. They had Moses believing for them. Do you believe God? Jesus said that when I come again, Will I find people believing, trusting me? And so you'll find only those that trust in the Lord, keep their focus on God, are the ones that God are, is able to help. And here's why. Because if there's a sheep that's trying to just go ahead and do their own thing, they wander off, so the shepherd has to go get them, pull them back into the flock. We don't want to wander off, okay? We want to stay close to the Lord because all the benefits come from following Jesus. Say amen. All right, so let's look at this. Second thing, developing in God's character. Do you know what? God wants us to be and have a character like his. Keep your word, amen? Do what God asks you to do. Let your yes be yes and no be no. Say amen. Thirdly, don't forget all his benefits. Sometimes we need to just go into the word of God pull out the promises and go over them and read them out loud to ourselves so we don't forget them. Remember, the mind stops, focuses on what you say. So let me suggest when you are sitting with God, pull out your scripture and put some promises verbally from your heart out so your brain gets them etched. Okay. So four things again. The word of his covenant. Know the word of his covenant. Remember, you have a covenant with God. Two, Developing in God's character. Be a man and woman of your word. Thirdly, don't forget all the benefits. Rehearse them in your mind. Put them into practice if you can. And fourthly, all believers must give an account before God. Okay, point one. The word of his covenant. Go with me to Hebrews. Look at this one. Hebrews chapter thir uh, 13, verse 20 and 21. I notice my raspy voice here. So, now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of, our she of the sheep, through the blood of an everlasting covenant. What does everlasting mean? Everlasting. <coughs> Excuse me. 
A covenant is between two members. Amen. And it's a bond. Okay? Cannot be broken. It's not supposed to be broken. Now today we have some poor examples of that. But how many know God keeps his word? The only problem is humans don't because we're, we have flaws. We don't mean to, but we, we just, all circumstances, you know. So God made a covenant that if kept, you would be blessed. Can you say amen? Now the problem is God made the covenant directly with uh, mankind. Can you say amen? And mankind has a flaw. So when God put pressure and says, I need you guys to do this, they could say no to him because they had a human will. So in that covenant, even though it was perfect, showed mankind they can't keep their word. Now that's not an insult to us. That's just the truth. Try to keep your word. And so what we are doing is we're learning and exposing ourselves to the glory of God. So look what it says again. Now may the God of peace who brought you up through the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, it goes on, make you complete. Say complete. What does that mean, Pastor Kerry? Whole. God is make us whole again. Now, I don't know about you. I said, Lord, you're making me whole. Would you hurry up? <laughs> Come on. Amen. I'm getting older now. He says, look. He says, one thing for, for sure, the more you get with me, the more I can change you into what I want and change how I want you to be. By your daily surrender, you grow quicker. With no daily surrender, then I have to get your attention, have to work you, sometimes rub you down just so I can get the word encouragement to you. And a lot of times the enemy's already there stirring up things. Say no. And it says, look, to make you complete in every good work, to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. Though Jesus Christ, to whom glory for, is forever and ever, amen. Now, down in or back in Hebrews, same chap, chapters, but in chapter 9, look at verse 15. And for this reason, remember the word of the covenant, we need to know the word of his covenant. By the way, that's the New Testament. The Old Testament's fulfilled. So don't try to keep it, okay? It will only point out your mistakes. And for this reason, he is a mediator, a go-between, an umpire of the new covenant by means of his death and for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant. Paul said something like this. He said, I would have never known that it was sinning until I saw the sinning sign. I'd never know I was speeding, officer, until I looked up and it said 35 and I was doing 45. The law was designed to point out what's wrong in our life so we would run to God and say, help, help, help. And then God the Father would send his son, Jesus Christ, so that we may have an access and a perpetuation or way out of this planet. Say amen. Well, I didn't know. I would have brought it up to you. I don't mind. We're all family here. Okay. That's my lovely wife. She is a wonderful lady. All right. So back to the covenant. When God gives his word in a covenant, he has to keep his word in the covenant. Say amen. A covenant is where blood is cut, where there's an agreement. That's the highest form of an agreement. So here's what happened. Mankind couldn't keep their word. So somebody had to come and stand in behalf of mankind to represent mankind because mankind are really in trouble. Who do you think came? Jesus. And the word became flesh, and he became a man born just like you and I, yet without sin, to fulfill the entire covenant and to represent you and I. And so, because he cut and shed his blood for us, and because of the covenant, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ made a covenant with each other. Jesus representing man and God representing God. And now there's an everlasting covenant that Satan can't touch and that you can't break. 
The only thing that you and I need is faith in God to get into the covenant. What if I, well, I drop the ball? God, get up, put your faith back into it. Don't, it's not stopping here. Remember, there's somebody here that wants you to stop, stop, stop. Remember, the first three letters in Satan is sat. Moving right along. The first point I want to give you to after this is because of the word of his covenant. In the word of God, we have two covenants, the old and the new. The old's fulfilled, but it's perfect and wonderful. So when you are reading the old and it tells you not to eat shrimp and fish and certain things, don't try to practice that again. Because the Bible says in the New Testament, everything is received in faith. God can cleanse all of that and make it healthy. You see? Old Testament, watch out, watch out, watch out. Be careful, be careful, be careful. New Testament, all things through prayer and supplication. It's not saying be foolish, but it's saying, hey, it's those limitations in the law was designed for only the Israelites. So they would know they need Jesus. That's the only reason. And if the Israelites have found Jesus, why go back and practice the law again? They will fall from grace. Now, it goes on further in point two. If the first covenant would have been faultless, the second covenant would not have been needed, right? The, the flaw is our, us as humans. We can't keep the word. So we need to have God in our heart helping us to keep our word. Say amen. Helping us to be better people. Say amen. Awesome. Thirdly, so Jesus came to finish the work of redemption and to complete a full rescue plan so that God can get his children back. Now, you guys, are, you guys have been parents. Maybe you've been uh, a mother. Maybe you're a grandmother, great-grandmother. Think about it. What would you do if somebody came by and kidnapped their child and you suddenly took them away? You would just do everything you can to get that child back. That's exactly what the father did. He sent his best man, the word, and he came to rescue us. We're in a rescue plan. And when the church misses the rescue plan, they get stale and they get displeasing to God. When we follow after winning souls first and, you know, being with God, then winning souls, touching lives, even though if it's just a little bit, you're doing the will of God. He's excited because we're supposed to spread the good news. If you don't like the good news, turn on the TV. <laughs> and you'll get the bad news. Amen. So quickly, going past that, the fourth point I want to make to you is the first covenant was perfect in all its design and did its job. Too bad the Jews didn't figure it out. Because when Jesus showed up and, and started doing the miracles, just like the Bible said, just like the, the Jewish covenant said, they were so blinded by their religious bigotry, and I'm not putting them down, that's what religion does. It blinds us to our own selfishness and our own righteousness. And no, no, no. And so if you try to follow that, it will make us either into a hypocrite or it will destroy us into receiving to a place of receiving Christ. The rock, we can either fall on the rock and say, I'm sorry, God, or we can have the rock fall on us, crush us to powder, Jesus said. The idea is Jewish people really were into what they were doing rather than the one who gave them a relationship. And so let's not, as Christians, do that either. Now, I'm not putting down anything. You just need to know the habits of religious, non-religious, so that you can navigate with the hope and the help of the Holy Spirit through this mess. There's a mess out there. Have you looked around? Some people can't stand it, so they live like a, like a, some kind of recluse. Okay, it's awful. But you know, when you're walking with Jesus, it's not awful. It's an opportunity to share Christ. Say amen. Right, Tina? Just share with your friends and your loved ones the good news of what God's doing in your life. And don't let the enemy throw you a left curve, because we're after Jesus. Can you say amen? 
All right, let's go on. Point five, we as humans must accept Jesus Christ as Lord into our heart. Then as we subject ourselves to him, we keep the covenant. If we fall short, it doesn't stop the covenant. It doesn't affect the covenant. I couldn't say, I don't want the covenant anymore. God says, you're only in the covenant because you're trusting me. You have my son in your heart. So the only reason we get to heaven is because we have who in our heart? Because of our good works? No. Because we have who in our heart? So you want to be able to make sure everyone that's your family, your friends, have actually asked Jesus into their heart. Don't assume they haven't. Just simply said, have you ever just simply said, I mean, you can make it fun. Ask, just simply said, God, Jesus, would you come into my heart and forgive me my sin? Have you actually said that, Bertha? Oh, oh, how dare you? Listen, you're infected with a terminal disease, and the only cure is what I have. And what I have, I give you. Would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Say amen. Don't be ashamed of him. All they can do is maybe give you a few words and tell you they don't want to. But if you never present it, how will they have that word? You know, once you speak a good word like that to somebody, even if they refuse to say they want anything, don't look at that. You already spoke the word into their heart. It's going to work all their life. So every time you see your loved one, say something about God as a seed. So it'll work in their hearts all their life. God won't let them forget it. Say amen. Don't think, well, I prayed for them. Don't think that way. That's coming from this. It has no power. You come from your heart and do what God said. Watch the blessings flow. Let me give you Hebrews chapter 10. Let's look at verse uh, 19 through 25. Those of you, thank you for watching and being in the service here. Verse 19, listen, just talk about the covenant. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus. Remember in the Old Testament, you could only go to a priest and the priest had to go to the other priest and they go in and talk to the whole, talk to God. One person to go in and talk to God for a whole nation. But now in the New Testament, we come right through with the holy presence of God and we can come boldly before the throne. Say amen. And we come by a new and living way, verse 20, which he consecrated for us through the veil. In other words, God broke out and he's letting us in through Jesus. That is his flesh. Jesus died, rose again broke the power of sin, hell, and the death of Satan and set us free. Now, it's up to us to choose that and follow Jesus out of here. Say amen. Let us draw near having a high, excuse me, I read the wrong one. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance, being trusting and with our bodies our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Thank you, Father. And let us consider one another. How you guys doing? In order to stir up love and good works. Come on, let's get to God. Let's get to God together. Let's create a whole community. In verse 25, that they not forsake the assembling of themselves together as the manner of some have. And just, I don't want to hire harp on this. But these are the last days, and one of the first things, if people will lose interest in God. It blows my mind. There's other things the enemy's doing out there that looks kind of fascinating. I've seen some of them. But it doesn't take me away from my relationship with God. Remember, Satan works the either or. Everyone say either or. It's going to either be God or it's not going to be God. And so he does that with all of us. He says, well, you want to be able to do this and do that, but if you are with, with God, you can't do that. Either or. Either or. He always makes something in opposition to what you want to do for God. You ever notice that? I can't do this because either or, or either. 
Remember, double-minded, either or, either or. Look at our politics, either or. <laughs> Be careful, because the indecision is the playground of Satan. All right, let's hold past then our confession of faith without wavering, for he is faithful who promised. And let us consider one another to stir up good works, and let's get together, let's get this thing done. Say amen. All right, point two, developing in God's character. How many know God is quite a wonderful God? He has no flaws. He's perfect. He does everything good. So that tells us that everything that's not good and not perfect Somebody else is also involved. So that's why we go and we walk with Jesus, because he helps us discern what is of God, what isn't in your daily walk. Oh, come on, Pastor Kate. No, I'm serious. Somebody could ask you to do something, and you're ready to do it, and you just, ah, what is that? You need to pray first. Remember, don't jump out ahead of God, even in the little things. Stop and say, okay, God, how about this? And let him continue to guide you. Say amen, everyone. Amen, everyone. All right, so developing God's character. Ephesians chapter 3. You've seen me read this before. I'm going to expound on it a little more. Verse 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees, Paul says, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. Got the hiccups. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, remember, he lives in you, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the where? Inner man. Everyone say inner man. That's your spirit man. Okay? That's not the inside of your head. It's your spirit man. He would make you strong in your spirit man. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You have to believe when you get up, God is there, that he's working with you. If you don't believe that, then your head's going to go off somewhere. Often does. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and you being rooted. Everyone say rooted. And grounded in love. Everything Jesus did was motivated by his compassion and the movement of God's love in him. We want to be the same way. I just don't want to say to you, hey, I love you dearly, but straighten up. I want to love you first. I hope you catch it before I say that. Amen. Pastors have to do some wonderful things sometimes. And, and it's not often easy because I'm not really not that kind of guy. But the Bible says that the captain has to see the ship is in tidy and not tidiness, but in control. If you get in an airplane, you want to make sure that the captain knows what he's doing. The pilot, can you say amen? Same deal. You want to make sure you pass, everything runs and functions. So you don't have to be worried about whether your car starts or not because it's already in tune. So is the service should be in tune, tuned up, everything keyed into glorifying God. And then you can come sit in God's presence and enjoy. Can you say amen? So the care of God that you may dwell in your hearts through faith and being rooted and grounded in love may be able to understand with all the saints what is the width, what the length, the depth, and height. Remember, we're like trees planted by the Lord. Okay. And know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So you grow in four directions. You grow in stability, root. Why? Because if you look around, there are a lot of Christians, there are a lot of leaves, but there are no fruit on their tree. There are a lot of promises and this and this, but there's not much follow through. Now, I'm not putting him on down. Remember, when Jesus came to a tree that promised fruit, he saw no fruit on it. It was just leaves. The message to us is, don't be just a Christian by word and promise. Be a doer of the words and you say amen. 
Now, he says, we be rooted and grounded in love. With the depth, the width, the width of character. Everyone say the width is my, what I learn, the what wisdom, the applications of what I learn. How I apply it is the character I am. Amen. When you look at BJ, you don't see Carrie. She has her own person. Can you say amen? And our person be, can develop into a person like Christ, or we can be our own character and develop not good at all. Now, I know all of you are very special because God made you unique, but without us putting our hands, ourselves in God's hands, our character won't develop in the right way. We might be a character, we won't develop in good character. Why? When we develop in the presence of God, not only do we have deep roots unmoved, but we have character, honesty. Our word means our word, and we keep that word. And we have length. Length shows how long are we going to keep this up? Are we serving God just as a dash to get your needs met? Or is this a lifetime walk, a race before him? So length is how you endure through your life. Now, I don't know about you. I've tried to teach us the more we can be with God, the more our life will take on his life and his protection. Whoa. I love that. And then not only it hype. Hype is our spirituality. And remember, Satan had Adam and Eve be tempted to eat that fruit, and they were poisoned and reduced and dumbed down. God said, if you'll come unto me, I will open the eyes of your understanding and enlighten you. In other words, I'll take the cap off your limitations and get you to think the way I think and operate the way I operate. How many here would like that? Wave your hands at me. Action depicts what you mean. Amen. And so how can that happen, Pastor Kerry? Easily. How surrendered you are to God. It's very important. Okay. You're wonderful, too. And so be not only rooted and grounded in this, in your, in your character, in your stability, in your endurance, and in your spirituality. Now, in Isaiah 61, verse 3, it says, we are the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. God even said in the parables through Jesus, he says, either make the tree good or the tree bad. What is he referring to? He says, we're set up kind of like a root of Jesse, a stem and root. We are a branch that's in the vine. In other words, get the idea of how we develop and grow. Now, you see all those trees out there? We have a beautiful yard. You go to Linda's place, it's beautiful. Those trees are kept alive by being in fellowship in the presence of God. They've never experienced falling away from God. So that's what makes them flourish. And if we care for our job to till the garden, they'll flourish. And if we keep ourselves with our shepherd, we'll flourish. The key is, don't leave. Why? So we might know the fullness of God. Let's go on. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly above and beyond anything that we think or ask according to the power that works in us. So that's verse 20. Who lives in us? Who's at work in us? Now you know all things work together for good. He's not talking about all things outwardly. He's talking about God and everything he's given you is working for your benefit. Can you say amen? And if we're one of those children, how many here have ever had a child who even though they look like they were listening, you know they haven't heard a word you said? Come on. Are you listening? Are you listening? Class. Remember that? Remember Sister Mary? Yes. Uh, well, I'm Brother Carrie Elephant. There you go. You know, I, I used to say that a long time ago. Listen, 
I could talk to you some wonderful things, but if you're not disciplined to really listen, you're not going to pick up much because your mind is only going to analyze what, what previous things you know to be the truth. And that's not good enough. Let the one in you bring the truth in. Say amen. That means prayer. You have to prepare and prepare, excuse me, prepare and pray yourself up before you come to church. Don't wait to come to church to get filled up. Get filled up before you come to church so you might give a little to somebody next to you. Say amen. A couple of points. Church, again, we are like trees. Amen. We grow four ways at once. And there are plenty of Christians that, that are more leaf than they are fruit. Don't be that way. Two, we are developing in character right before God. It comes through an obedience to hear and do his word. If we don't hear the word and then practice it, character cannot be built. Because God doesn't build his character in his presence. He builds his character and our character by our obedience to doing, hearing, and doing the word. Say amen. Thirdly, the developing of God's wisdom and character in us is through our diligence to be with him and just to love him. And fourthly, the word can't be challenged at all. Satan can't argue. He can tell you to put the word in your head and argue with it. But the word is already there. It's settled. If God said it, he'll bring it to pass. Hello? God is not a man that he would lie, nor the son of man that he would do something he had to repent. Had he spoken it? And he will bring it to pass. God has set in heaven the word. Now, let me show you. The word in heaven says, by his stripes, you were healed. So if you seek God and say, Lord, I need you to heal me, you also have to realize that the package of healing is right there. You, by faith, reach up, grab it, believe you receive it, start thanking him for it, comes in like a seed, and you can be immediately healed or healed after a period of time when the word of healing generates in your soul. Hello? But forever, the word is settled. So, did Jesus pay the price for our healing? So, why are we asking him, why haven't you healed me yet? Because we're not realizing that healing is always present. Whether it's received or not, it's up to each individual. Say amen. And we have to do it by faith. Everybody that came to Jesus received from him by faith. Hello? If people could care less, like the Pharisees, Sadducees, they didn't receive anything. Come to church, don't pay attention make a disturbance, whatever, it doesn't matter. If you don't come to li listen and learn, you're not going to receive much. And you guys receive well. You draw it out of me. I can't shut up. All right, let's go on. And fourthly, the word can't be challenged at all by anyone or anything. The covenant's already established. All God requires for us is to come awake, put our faith in it, and trust and believe in it. Say amen. And he'll keep his word to you. In fact, I can never say God never kept his word to me. None of us can. All right. Let's move on to the next scripture or next point. Don't forget all his benefits. Put them into practice. And you know the scripture, Psalms 103, 1 through 5. As you go there, I want to just kind of read Matthew. It says, Jesus said, either make the tree good or the fruit good, or make the tree bad or its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. So listen, let your life be full of fruit. I know all your lives are. And the more fruity you are, the more God loves it. So you can say, I'm a fruit for Jesus. That'd be a good t-shirt, wouldn't you say? All right, don't forget all his benefits. Psalms 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul.
forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Now, these are your benefits. Who redeems your life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who, I love this, satisfies your mouth with good things. Don't speak problems. Don't state the obvious. Stop telling everybody what the devil's doing. Start speaking God. And then the other times, don't speak so much about what the enemy's doing. He loves the attention. Don't give it to him. Say, all right. So he satisfies your mouth with good things that your youth is renewed like the eagle. You see, when we get in the presence of God, actually God is reversing and slowing down the curse in our body. So if I can encourage you, if you can arrange it, you need to spend a whole lot more time as he continues. Now, remember, we've been damaged through the sin, our forefathers and our sin and our life, and we still need healing. So that's why Paul and Jesus encourages us to not look at others who need healing too because it's easy to pick on faults. Look at the good and pray for them so that you may reap what you sow. All right, all believers must give an account. Ho, ho. The word is forever settled in heaven, folks, point one. The covenant of promises are set. We didn't make them. We just, by faith, get in on them. In the New Testament, we have all these benefits that we just read in Christ. They are in him, yes, and they're in him, amen. And they come into us by the word in seed form. Thirdly, just for example, these words for salvation, and there, here's these two words, you might write them down. Sozo, S-O-Z-O, and Soteria, S-O-R-T-E-R-I-A. These are two words in the New Testament for salvation or being saved. Hello? How many are saved? Now, they're also the same word for being healed, being preserved, being made whole, being sound and protected. So if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, and it was made unto us salvation, then if we keep open, keep receiving, Healing comes with salvation. Wholeness comes with salvation. Deliverance, protection comes with salvation because it comes in by seed form. Then it says for us to hold fast to the confession of our faith. Why? Because the seeds will grow and God will bring forth the promises. But we have to, with patience, wait for them. Now, folks, who is patience? Jesus, and he's in you. Stop being religious. You don't have patience enough to wait for it. Come on, laugh with me. No, the patient one is in you. Just kick back and let God work. I know it's really hard for some of us because we feel like we have to be busy all the time. And if you have, have a problem with that, be careful you don't turn into a busy body. <coughs> I have to take a drink there. That was a joke, by the way. Are you with me? I sure love you. All right, so let's look at a couple other things. For example, salvation and healing. So when you're praying for your healing, Father, your word says, by his stripes, because of Jesus, I was healed. By his stripes, I am healed. So this is your word. And so, Father, I believe I receive your word and receive my healing. I hope you're paying close attention. Then, actually, the word will go into your heart, germinate, and healing will come. It could come instantly, or it could come after a little while. The key is, don't be so foolish to dig up your seed in the next day. Father, I believe I received my healing. Don't feel anything different. I won't see anything different. Well, I guess it didn't work. We just dug up your seed. You have to plan another one. 
that when you plant the seed, you water it. You care for it. Father, every day, by his stripes I'm healed, even though my body's still trying to rebel. By his stripes I am healed. Thank you, God. You're changing me from glory to glory, Father. So you have to keep looking up. Because if you look down, it'll take away your faith and kind of make your hope sick. Say, oh, me. Now, the Bible says you were healed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ two or 2,000 years ago. So you can receive it as an accomplished part of your covenant, or you can keep on hoping that God's going to touch you. There's where a lot of Christians are. You're already touched. Let's think of the humor in this. God, come down and touch me. Help me now. And God says, look, I'm in your heart. What are you asking? <laughs> Come hold my hand, oh God. Now listen, I'm not trying to put anybody down. He says, hold your hand. I'm in your heart. So a lot of this religious stuff, make sure it is clicking with who Jesus and your relationship is. Say amen. And certainly don't teach stuff like that. I turn up songs that say, oh, just put your hand in the hand of the man. Great song. But it's a wonderful song. But don't just put your hand in the hand. Jump in the water. Can you say amen? Anyway, the idea behind it is just your brain listens to your words. So Satan gives a song that sounds good, and we just get to singing it because we like the rhythm, and it's saying, I'm crying, then I'm dying. I can't wait for the next disaster to happen. You ever go into those, some of those places where they're playing that hip-hop, and they're talking about rape and murder? That's all programming of Satan trying to get that generation to take on the beast. Oops, I let something out of the bag there. Trying to turn the generation into animals. Take a look around you shortly. All right, next one. All believers must give an account. Now, this is when I got a hold of this teaching, and I know some of you know this, but let's look at it again. This is a teaching about accountability. The importance that your father has sent your son or sent his son, Jesus, to mediate and be your best friend, to help us in our shortcomings, to help us and to give us a leg up, <laughs> you know, and help us. That's, that's it. We shouldn't be focusing on all of this other stuff. We should be focusing on the help that God has given us. Tina, amen. What the enemy does is he tries to get us involved in everything. The Bible warns us, don't be entangled in the fears of this world. It will weaken your faith. Let Jesus be involved. Release Jesus. Pray Jesus into that. But don't you be emotionally or anything involved in something where it's going to drain you. Remember, Satan is a mosquito. He sucks your blood. He feeds on strife and arguments, feeds on unsurety. He stirs us up, hoping to feed him. Don't you feed your enemy by not walking with Jesus. And finishing. All right, Romans chapter 14. Here is a sobering word for all of us as Christians. I love the book of Romans, by the way. Some of the most strongest doctrines of Christianity are laid out within the pages. All right, in verse 9, listen to what it says. For to this end, Christ died and rose again. This is why he did it. That he might be Lord of both the dead, those that passed before us, and the living. Say amen. But why do you judge your brother? In other words, look at their faults, judge them, make comments on them. Or why do you show contempt to your brother? I just hate it when pastor walks in. You know, that kind of stuff. I'm just using me as an example. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. When you get resurrected, when you get raptured, you're going to go right before Jesus. And you're going to have a personal audience with him. And this is what's going to happen. Come before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us, I got to see us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another 
anymore. But rather resolve this, that we don't put a stumbling block or an occasion for our brother to stumble in our brother's way. In other words, don't be malicious to cause a problem. Say amen. We're peacemakers. Don't try to prove that you're right. Satan loves arguments. I had a guy come to me, and a wonderful man. He has a wonderful family, but he loved to argue scripture. I always always look at him and says, you know, I just don't argue scripture. And they says, why not? It says contend for the gospel. Yeah, it says contend against sinners for the gospel. But it didn't say for brothers and sisters to be arguing amongst themselves over doctrine. Hello? Why? It beats the devil. <laughs> Remember, I don't want to give the devil the gun to shoot me. So Jesus said, learn to walk in love. Fulfill the two commandments. Love the God, Lord thy God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as I have loved you. Amen. So fill all the requirements of the law, and then if you walk in me, you become protected. Yes. So then, each of us shall give an account before God. Therefore, don't judge. A couple points, church. One of the most sobering things to realize is that we shall all give account of our words and our actions before Christ. Two, should, we should daily realize this. This will make sure, Lord, if I did anything yesterday, please cleanse it out of me. Say amen. Now, some of you are such saints, you probably wouldn't do anything wrong. Right? Amen. Two, we should daily realize this. Now, thirdly, so the earth shall give an so that each one of us shall give an account of what we have done for God. Now, these are only Christians. This is not the world. They got their own judgment. So when we are following the Lord, the best thing I can tell you is make sure every day you get up, present yourself to him, and say, Lord, I just want to please you. Guide my steps. He'll be so pleased you do that because that's more than 80% of the body of Christ does. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because usually it's, it's not until we realize we need to pray that we do. That's the way a lot of people are. Not upholding them. They just don't know any better. Nobody's teaching anymore. They're not teaching about prayer. Come to prayer meetings. Jeez, you know, what's going on? They're all dancing around like some theater waiting for Jesus to come. That's not good. We need to get into the word. And start helping others, Tina, to win them to Jesus. Touch lives. Amen. All right. Are you ready? Finally, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at this other scripture on dealing with it. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether presence or absent, whether dead or living, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may Receive the things done in the body, what you've done, according to what he has done. Now listen, whether good or bad. Now this is not evil. This is good or bad. What would be bad? Talking bad a brother, a brother gossiping, uh, disrespectful to your country. I mean, you might not like the country, but don't, you don't have to show disrespect. Why? Because that feeds the devil. Remember, he's feeding off of you. You used to be his. Now you've given your heart to God. Don't let him continue to feed off your flesh. Present it to God. Crucify it every day and live marvelously before God so he doesn't have anything to feed on. How many here like a bunch of flies landing on you? How about a wasp? You're out at a picnic. Well, that's what he is. Don't do things to let him land on you. He might fly by, but don't let him camp on you. All right. And this says, plan each day to please God, win souls, touch lives, and pray for others. My, we have such a good life, don't we? Hello? Why would we want to get involved in anybody else's troubles? Only to pray for them and help them. Amen. And it says, finally, in verse 12, so then each of us shall give an account of himself before God. Therefore, let each of us not judge one another anymore. Say amen. Why? 
doesn't do any good. How many here have faults? Don't raise your hands. If we have faults, let's work on that with God. Not tattling on our brothers or sisters. Hello. Now, why am I saying that to you? Because I think you're doing that. No. Remember what a preacher's job is. Present a truth. You take it. Go before God. Pray about it. And he helps you, making sure that that helps you grow and develop. Four ways. Depth, width, height, and length. Amen. Then, so guess what? I'm going to try to get my page to turn. It won't turn. And finishing. Go down to chapter 5, look at verse 9. So therefore, let us make it our aim, whether to be present or absent, whether we be dead or alive, every day and every way to walk with God. Amen. The reason, listen, let me share this and then we'll close. I have the distinct privilege when I was younger, uh, and Scott will testify this, and Peggy and several people that knew me a long time ago, and they'll testify that God allowed me to live a changed life before my mom and dad, and they seen how drastically I changed. That I'm not the person that they knew bringing me up. And I something had happened to me, and changed me. And I got a chance periodically. One time I said to my folks, oh, boy, man, I'm changed. I found Jesus in my heart. My dad would say, well, at least now I know you're going to tell me the truth. And my mom would just giggle. And I, one time I says, do we pray over our meals? My dad proudly stood up and says, of course we do. I says, Dad, I don't remember one time we prayed over our meals. He says, let's pray over our meals. So every once in a while I would drop little hints. And finally during Christmas time, God brought my mom and dad up to a Christmas time meeting in the house while we just sang Christmas carol and talked about Christmas and, and Christ. And after all of that, we sang some hymns. The power of God just dropped down, and we all took hands and prayed. And when we did, my dad started crying. He says, do you think Jesus would accept me, all the bad things I did in my life? I said, Dad, yes, he would. And I went out to pray for him. He fell right on the floor. On the floor, just under the power of the Spirit of God. God did that. And he's crying and, oh, Jesus, this is wonderful. And my mom, you got to get the humor in this. My mom, she's screaming, don't you hurt him. Don't you hurt him. I don't know what's going on, but don't you hurt my husband. She gets saved six months later. I can actually tell you that if you live a life that is wonderful before God. And remember, God's going to help you. Your family will see you changed. My mom and my dad both came to Jesus because they saw God work in me. Well, if you got something out of this morning, we give the Lord a praise. Amen. <laughs>